since time began. When exactly was that, and why don't we know? Join us as we explore mysteries in time from past to present, and perhaps even the future. Has there been a conspiracy to hide ancient eras and civilizations? Does ignorance of the hidden past keep us entrenched in a mindset that can be controlled? What would we learn if revelations have already been authenticated, but never published or distributed, and more importantly, have yet to be exposed? Join us as Mysteries in Time shines a beacon of light for the growth of humanity. Philosopher George Santayana said, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Let's throw off the veil of historical secrets. Tonight, we discuss how ancient artifacts were stolen from Iraq and Syria and appear in the most mysterious of places. Hobby Lobby? aftermath of the United States invasion of Iraq, Iraqi archaeological objects were stolen and smuggled worldwide. Perhaps the most notable instance is when CEO of Hobby Lobby Steve Green traveled to the United Arab Emirates in 2010 and agreed to buy more than 5,500 artifacts for $1,600,000. The scheme involved a number of middlemen and the use of phony or misleading invoices, shipping labels, and other paperwork to slip the artifacts past U.S. Customs agents. Green's operation was discovered in 2011 when custom agents in Memphis, Tennessee opened several of the FedEx packages labeled as handmade tiles from Turkey. The tiles, it turns out, were thousands of rare cuneiform tablets dating to the Sumerian and Babylonian era and the dawn of writing. In other shipments, ancient cuneiform tablets were labeled ceramic tiles and items carried paperwork that said they came from Turkey, United Arab Emirates, or Israel. Prosecutors said artifacts were also deliberately undervalued when one shipping label listed 300 clay tiles valued at a dollar each, when they were actually clay seals with a combined value of $84,120. Green financed the $500 million Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. in 2017. Originally, Green had intended the articles to be displayed in the museum, which includes pieces from the family's collection from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Bronze Gates inscribed with text from the Gutenberg Bible. Prosecutors say Hobby Lobby was warned by its own expert that acquiring antiquities from Iraq carried considerable risk because of so many of the artifacts being stolen. Subsequently, Hobby Lobby agreed to forfeiture of the artifacts, 3,800 in all, some cuneiform tablets, and an additional $3 million to resolve the civil action. When Green was interviewed by the Associated Press, he stated, Early on, we were always trying to find the best experts we could to help us as we were acquiring antiquities. And so, mistakes were made, and we learned from the mistakes and put processes and procedures in place to try to improve on that. There is a lot of complexities in the areas, and I'm still a novice at it. But we're engaging the best experts we can to advise and help in that process. The smuggled items include cuneiform tablets, bricks, and other clay artifacts mostly stemming from the Sumerian city of Isagrig. The artifacts are dated about 2,000 years old. Outside of the notoriety of Hobby Lobby's acquisitions, the sudden appearance in private collections of significant numbers of previously unknown artifacts raises red flags for those who follow the antiquities trade. Over the last 25 years, there's been a deep concern regarding the illegally acquired antiquities out of the Middle East. There's always a strong market for biblical and other religious items, meaning that the looting of archaeological sites is a constant threat. Typically, the trade in these items has been controlled by powerful central governments, but in the wake of the Gulf War and the series of destabilizing crises that have followed, the government controls have become practically non-existent. 
we now have what Edward Plants, a United Nations specialist on this topic, describes as a massive looting of cultural property in the region. How is it possible that these ancient treasures can be stolen, trafficked worldwide, profiting governments, criminals, and even terrorist organizations? As the full extent of the looting of Iraq's National Museum in Baghdad emerges, it becomes clear that there was nothing accidental about it. Rather, it was a result of a long-planned project to plunder the artistic and historical treasures that are held in the museums of Iraq. The responsibility would have rested with the American administration that refused, despite repeated warnings, to provide the security of Baghdad's cultural buildings. Once the museum staff were able to communicate with the outside world, however, it became apparent that the looting was not random, but it was the work of people who knew what they were looking for and came specifically equipped for the job. The American military authorities had made no effort to prevent the objects leaving Baghdad or even to put in process an international search for the stolen artifacts. The U.S. reluctance to act cannot be explained by any lack of warning. The museum was a victim of a carefully planned assault. The thieves who took the most valuable material came prepared with equipment to lift the heaviest objects, which the staff could not move from the galleries. And they also had keys to the vaults where the most valuable items were stored. Not since the Nazis systematically stripped the museums of Europe has such a crime been committed. The U.S. online publication of Business Week magazine reiterated the theme of premeditation and conspiracy in looting of Iraq's museums in an article headlined, Were Baghdad's Antiquity Thieves Ready? The article carries the subtitle, They may have known just what they were looking for because dealers ordered the most important pieces well in advance. Contrast this with the images shown on television of the museum lobby where angry mobs smashed 2,000-year-old statues. The primary storage facility had been breached, and some 15,000 objects, no one knows exactly how many, were gone. Among the missing pieces were thousands of tiny cylinder seals, as well as several iconic artifacts. Notable is the Lady of Warka, a stone head of a woman found at Uruk, which is considered the world's oldest city. Donnie George, director of the Department of Research and Studies at the Iraqi State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, described the chaos. The people saw the Americans firing on the gates of Saddam's palaces and then opening the doors to the people and saying, Come and take this stuff. It's yours now. So they started, and it became sort of a rage as they attacked every government building. I don't make excuses, but you know, after 30 years of a regime like that, the pressure builds up on people. Most of them were not educated, and to them, the museum was just one more government building. They didn't just take antiquities, but 95% of the office furniture, all computers, most of the cameras. My office was two feet deep in papers, my desk was broken into three pieces, and I found my chair a hundred yards away. Some 2,500 years earlier, the Persian king Cyrus the Great was able to storm nearby Babylon, then the world's largest city. But texts from the time relate that there was no chaos or looting. However, in 2003, American troops failed to secure what was second on their own list after the central bank of important places to protect in the modern Iraqi capital. Archaeologists had even visited the Pentagon prior to the invasion to provide military officials with detailed coordinates of all major Iraqi cultural heritage sites. The looting of the museum was over in less than 48 hours after it began on April 10, 2003, but it was only the start of a decade of disaster for Iraq's cultural heritage heritage that includes the world's first cities, empires, and writing systems. More than ancient vases and display cases were affected, the invasion began a grim era of sectarian violence and lawlessness in the very land that developed the state, legal codes, and recorded history itself. Looting, particularly in southern Iraq, which was the center of ancient Mesopotamia, had already begun in earnest in the late 1990s and grew to alarming proportions by 2004 and 2005, long after the National Museum was secured. 
the United States, its allies, and the fledgling government of post-Saddam Iraq did little to address the sources of the problem. More ominously, a new generation of Iraqis has grown up without any access to the impressive network of museums across the country that were once filled with school children. They know little of their ancient past. Many Iraqi politicians today have a bent towards Islamic fundamentalism that is no friend to secular archaeology. Lawa Samaisim, the tourism minister overseeing the State Board of Antiquities, is a member of the Splinter Shiite Party. He has reduced the board's authority and is openly hostile to foreigners. American archaeologists are now forbidden to excavate in Iraq until a trove of Jewish artifacts removed by U.S. government is returned, and Samaisim recently suggested that the Germans might not be welcome either until the famous Babylonian Ishtar Gate, the model for the National Museum Gateway, is returned. If you want to think about unity, then the ancient past is a broadly shared culture, says Elizabeth Stone, an SUNY Stony Brook archaeologist who spent years excavating in Iraq. She states ancient Mesopotamia was real and that could be easily be used as a basis for national unity. It is worth noting that there were no follow-up congressional hearings or independent investigations to pinpoint the parties responsible for the negligence connected to the museum debacle. No one in the U.S. military was criticized, demoted, or court-martialed. A Marine, who claimed the Iraqis were using the site as a base to fight Americans, wrote the only formal report in the matter. The staff of the Iraqi National Museum showed enormous bravery and foresight by removing and safely storing 8,366 artifacts before the looting. Some 15,000 articles were taken during those 36 hours. While 7,000 items have been recovered, more than 8,000 remain unaccounted for, including artifacts thousands of years old from some of the earliest sites in the Middle East. The looting is regarded as one of the worst acts of cultural vandalism in modern times, but much more of Iraq's rich cultural history has been destroyed, damaged, or stolen in the years since. Indeed, illegal trade in looted antiquities is growing. The museum's collection of cylinder seals, for example, used to print images usually into clay, was hit especially hard as they were easy to conceal and transport, and had ready overseas markets. Of the 5,144 taken, over just half have been returned. Some high-value items looted from the museum were so recognizable that they could not possibly appear on the open market, suggesting that they were taken with buyers already lined up. Others have come home following international investigations, such as the statue of Assyrian King Argon II seized from New York City in 2008 and returned to the museum in 2015. Likewise, the heaviest item stolen, a headless statue of the Sumerian King Entemena of Lagash, was recovered in New York in 2006 with the help of an art dealer. The museum looting should have been a clarion call for the need of better protection of antiquities in conflict zones, both from combatants and local populations. Sadly, this has not been the case. There have been subsequent destruction of archaeological sites and museums in Syria and Libya as well, ISIS selling antiquities to finance weapons, and increases in thefts from both public and private collections and from archaeological sites. In late 2017, an investigation by the Wall Street Journal presented the sobering assessment that over 100,000 antiquities are offered for sale online daily, of which 80% are likely to be faked or looted. Today's antiquities black market is using social media platforms and messenger apps to reach buyers in a way that would have been inconceivable to looters in 2003. There has been a surge in antiquities originating in Syria online since the outbreak of the Civil War. Ironically, centuries after many of the remains of these ancient cultural entities were looted by the European colonial forces in order to fill grand national museums, we're seeing a 21st century version of the cultural colonialism. Private collectors are enabling an entire economy of illegal activities. With all the confusion, it's hard to get a handle on who is really responsible for the loss of these priceless treasures. Let's examine the power players behind the thefts and how covert actions enabled funding for terrorism. Yeah.
happens. And it's untidy. And freedom's untidy. And free people are free to make mistakes and commit crimes and do bad things. They're also free to, to, to live their lives and, and do wonderful things. And that's what's going to happen. Declaring that freedom is, quote, untidy, unquote, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld in 2003 said that the looting of Iraq was a result of pent-up feelings of oppression and that it would subside as Iraqis adjusted to life without Saddam Hussein. He also asserted that the looting was not as bad as some television and newspaper reports have indicated and that there was no major crisis in Baghdad, the capital city, which lacked a governing authority. The looting, he suggested, was, quote, part of the price, unquote, for what the United States and Britain have called the liberation of Iraq. Fast forward to 2016, police raid four homes in Schumann, Bulgaria, looking for contraband that regularly traverses this country on the way to markets in Western Europe and America. In one rusting shed behind an apartment block, they found a cache of looted antiquities, 19 classical statues, and fragments of marble or limestone. For every seizure like the one in Bulgaria, many other pieces are believed to have reached dealers and buyers in Vienna, Munich, London, and New York. Dealers exploit the legal trade in antiquities to move objects that have been looted for years amid the conflicts in Syria and Iraq, as well as Libya, Yemen, and Egypt. Regarding antiquities, laws around the world are weak and inconsistent, and customs enforcement can only screen a portion of what crosses international borders. Since the first Gulf War in 1991, Iraqi antiquities have flooded into the market from museums that were looted and from archaeological sites that have been attacked with bulldozers. This plundering of Iraq's cultural heritage has only whetted the appetite of collectors who are already responsible for looting Far Eastern, Latin American, and Italian archaeological sites. With the collapse of global stock markets, works of art and antiquities have become regarded highly as a secure investment fueling an already huge underground market. The illegal trade in antiquities is thought to be as lucrative as drug trafficking to which it has often been linked. Switzerland, for example, which allows artwork that has been in the country for five years to be granted a legal title, is a key transshipment point in the smuggling of artifacts. One smuggler told the London Guardian, the government is in pocket of the art market which wants to keep the flow of antiquities. The National Library of Iraq was the home to rare and centuries old illuminated copies of the Quran. It and other examples of Islamic calligraphy, such as irreplaceable historical documents from the Ottoman Empire, perished when the building was set on fire. After the fate of the Baghdad Museum, it can only be concluded that the generalized looting and arson at the libraries served to cover up a more systematic crime in which select manuscripts were stolen for wealthy collectors. While the looting of these ancient treasures in and of themselves is disturbing, the fact that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist organizations have been profiting handsomely from the smuggling of artifacts is alarming. In 2011, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, better known as ISIS, was just a small group of extremist Sunni Muslim militants battling to bring down the Syrian government. But over time, ISIS has emerged as a major insurgency operating in all Middle Eastern and Northern African countries. How did ISIS grow so swiftly and raise enough money to buy weapons for its army? Much evidence suggests that ISIS cashed in on the Syrian oil fields it captured. But in 2014, Iraqi intelligence officers discovered new sources of its income, report the London Guardian. While securing the house of a dead ISIS commander, the Iraqis seized more than 160 computer flash drives containing detailed financial records of the insurgents. Listed among ISIS's key financial transactions were records of illicit antiquity trafficking. One region in Syria alone, the group reportedly netted up to $36 million from these activities. Such profiteering fits well with a long-standing pattern in this region, says Thomas Lavoti, a Ph.D. student at the University of Montana, who is discovering the impact of counterinsurgencies on archaeological sites. Both Al-Qaeda and the Taliban looted antiquities for the purpose of funding their operations, he notes, and ISIS is likely using the same funding model, particularly as cash flow from other sources dries up. 
The U.S. is freezing bank accounts and cracking down on false charities, Lavodi adds. So ISIS has to go to alternative methods of financing. Since the beginning of the Syrian civil war, looters have pillaged many of its important archaeological sites for marketable artifacts. For example, Google Earth images of the ancient city of Apamea founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals and nominated in 1999 as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, clearly reveal the massive destruction that followed the onset of the war. In less than nine months, from July 20, 2011 to April 4, 2012, the once pristine area was trashed by looters. By late 2013, more than 90% of Syria's cultural sites lay in regions of fighting and civil unrest, leaving them more open to plunder. So grave was the situation that the International Council of Museums published an emergency red list of Syrian cultural objects at risk, putting border guards and law enforcement worldwide on alert for a wide range of smuggled artifacts from bronze swords to delicate glass bottles. To this day, Iraqi intelligence officers are still analyzing ISIS flash drives to determine just what role the Sunni extremists are playing in Syria's illicit antiquity trade. But Sam Hardy, an archaeologist at University College London who studies the trade in illicit antiquities, notes that the insurgents and paramilitaries generally entered the trade in at least one of three ways. By running a trafficking network, by facilitating smuggling through a service, or by levying attacks on traffickers who move looted artifacts through their territory. Hardy suggests that ISIS commanders are likely imposing a levy on smugglers. ISIS, he quotes, looks like they want to function as a state, so in that sense they would at least have been doing taxation. But he also noted that it may not be the end of it. The talk is, is that they are running out of the oil management and smuggling operations. Quite simply, ISIS profits from loot and regulates black market profits. Investigators have also noted that it's clear that the objects came to the West. The FBI has issued warnings that looted artifacts are on the market, and the notice is supported by first-hand accounts of Syrian objects being bought and sold. Impoverished, unemployed locals loot objects to support and feed their families, paying ISIS attacks on artifacts leaving its territory. Turkey commonly serves as a gateway for these items, and the items reach the international market quickly. The works enter commerce surreptitiously, often sold online via photos or video chat, with items even appearing on eBay. Investigations have confirmed that illicit goods have reached buyers in the United States and Europe. For many Syrian traders and smugglers, deprived from the country's six-year civil war, selling antiquities has become a necessity. One so-called middleman, Mohammed Aj al-Hassan, described how ISIS overran his home in Syria and nearly executed him on suspicion of his sympathy for the Free Syrian Army. He later reluctantly began trading artifacts for ISIS to European buyers at the request of Abu Laith Da'ari, the group's head of antiquities. The importance that ISIS places on the trade of antiquities is reflected in the group's use of foreign jihadis to manage its operation. The cadre of international fighters is considered more loyal than their local counterparts. Locals are given licenses by ISIS to dig for antiquities. Their licenses were initially free, but now the group charges 20% of the value for each object evacuated. ISIS demands that all discovered items be resold directly to the militant group itself. It then reaches out to dealers worldwide. Hassan described how he had recently sold two antique Bibles for $11,800 to a Russian buyer in a city in southern Turkey. The Bibles from eastern Syria were then smuggled out of Turkey, hidden in a truck filled with vegetables. Hassan kept a commission of 25% for facilitating the sale. The rest of the profits were given to a trader who had transported the Bibles to Turkey. Another middleman described how he paid $1,000 to a Syrian woman who carried a bronze Roman statue across the border between Syria and Turkey. The piece had come from Raqqa and may have been fake. The Western appetite for antiquities has always been a motivation for others to loot them. The same individuals who pride themselves on their appreciation of cultural heritage create situations that lead to the pillage of these ancient sites. The trade in illicit artifacts is fueled by demand 
and when objects are given an economic value, Western buyers purchase the antiquities at a depressed price after they have passed from the hands of looters, smugglers, or middlemen, creating greater incentives to loot and smuggle. Tellingly, there's been a vast increase in the supply of antiquities from Syria and Iraq. According to U.S. Customs, there has been a 145% increase in the imports of Syrian cultural property and a 61% increase in imports from Iraq cultural property between 2011 and 2013, suggesting that the illicit trade is piggybacking on the legal trade. Government officials opine that antiquities have become more significant revenue source for ISIS as the conflict has progressed. American and European legislatures are attempting to tackle the problem by proposing laws to reduce the influx of plundered antiquities. Yet, even with targeted laws, unscrupulous buyers will purchase the loot. Collectors should be made aware that there are dangers other than illegal penalties. Illicit goods are often problematic from an investing perspective as well. At resale, lower prices are generated for objects without clear ownership histories. Provenance, an object's over ownership history, is considered during the valuation process, and pieces with strong provenance typically sell for significantly higher prices. If a work is revealed to be looted, there may be a cloud on its title that diminishes its value and makes work vulnerable to seizure. Buyers may be rightfully haunted by their purchases for years to come. There are organizations monitoring the market, art historians examining contested works, archaeologists actively searching for loot, attorneys and governments worldwide searching and preparing to prosecute art crimes. Social networks and the media have an important role to play in disseminating this information. Just as ISIS uses the media to display destruction, the media should educate and warn the public about the way in which sales of looted antiquities fund further plunder. It's imperative that collectors recognize that purchasing illicit objects is not rescuing artifacts from destruction. In fact, it is encouraging more destruction. For collectors, the solution is simple. Don't buy antiquities without completing due diligence. If you truly love art and antiquities, don't buy stolen art. So, imagine if you will, years of sanction caused economic hardships affecting the United States. Combine that with an unpopular president who is torn from office by a foreign invasion. How does civilization remain intact? Or, like Iraq, do we split into warring factions and turn on each other? Let's examine how the people of Iraq have started to heal from the wounds of war. After 15 years of bitter and bloody civil war, Iraq is finally turning the corner not only on rebuilding its society, but rebuilding the history that was stolen from the country. Think back to shortly after the invasion of 2003, when senior Iraqi antiquities official Donnie George called the looting the crime of the century because it affects the heritage of all mankind. I felt like I was bleeding, like I had a deep cut in my heart, related George. When ISIS swept into Mosul, Leela Salih begged the militants not to destroy the Mosul Museum where she worked, or the archaeological site at Nimrod where she helped oversee just south of the city. I told them we would destroy the graves ourselves if they just left the buildings standing, she told NBC News. I begged them to save Iraq's history. But the police fell on deaf ears. Several videos released by the militants show ISIS fighters using sledgehammers, power tools, and bulldozers to demolish priceless structures and stone carvings. What they didn't destroy with explosives, they tore down by hand. Salih tears up thinking about Nimrod's destruction. 60% of what's been excavated is now gone, according to her estimate. Seeing Nimrod as a schoolgirl inspired her to become an archaeologist. Many of her colleagues are still trapped inside the city. Wiping her eyes, it's a tragic thing. Our culture, our history, our memories, relates Shaima, who worked at the Iraqi National Museum since 1999. They tried to destroy the identity of Iraq. The only thing that we can do now is document the damage so we can start thinking of how to rebuild again. 
You know what we've been through, and it was very dangerous, she says. So many things are happening that convince us that things are actually changing for the better. Among them is the reemergence of her beloved museum after the devastation by looting early in the war. We were heartbroken. It's like someone takes your heart or takes one of your children. Any human would feel this way, says Shaima. But we are an optimistic people. We have turned back with so much help. Indeed, the transformation at the museum shows a determined optimism in a nation where pessimism has become ingrained. It's the consequences of war that result in the loss of treasures and heritage. Black marketers, governments, and unscrupulous buyers participate in the outright theft of a nation's identity. It's refreshing to note that the human spirit can and will rebuild from these desperate circumstances. Thank you for joining us on Mysteries in Time.